Joel Schneider, Bud and Breakfast, uh, which is providing a safe place for the consumption of legal cannabis in Colorado, something that is uh, needed. Uh, so we thought it was important to have a conversation with Joel and let you know who he is and how he got to where he is and uh, what he's doing now and uh, where he's going. So enjoy. Okay, so we've got uh, Joel Schneider, CEO, Bud and Breakfast out of Colorado. Joel Schneider, how are you? I am well, Seth. How are you? Well, the first thing that uh, we realize when you say hello is that you're certainly not from Colorado. No, that's I can't. It's it's hard to hide my accent. It sounds like yours. Uh, no, I'm originally from New York and uh, moved out to Denver uh, uh, about twelve months ago. All right, and so what uh, the nature of these uh, conversations are is we're going to go all the way back and then we'll come forward. Um, as far as my description of you, if asked to describe you, I would say that you are the definition of New York. Now, that's mostly for people that are outside of New York, but how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm a transplant in New York. I mean, but my whole life was, was I was born and raised on Long Island. And, uh, you know, obviously I can't get rid of this accent that uh, I've been blessed with or cursed with. I don't know which it is. But... Uh, uh, it, this goes back, it's funny, you know, it's, even when I went to law school, and this is 30 some odd years ago, uh, I was called Mr. New York. I guess this, this, this accent is, uh, is what, I'm, what I have, and I'm, I'm going to stick with it. It's legit, is what they say, Joel. <laughs> it's real. It's real. You can't make it up. <laughs> where are you from? Where, so let's, let's try to figure it out. Where, where are you from on Long Island? I grew up in uh, Merrick, which is on the south shore of Long Island, in between Freeport and Belmore, on uh -huh. the uh, Babylon uh, train line, uh, and um, went to Belmore Kennedy High School and uh, went to University of Buffalo. That's where I did my college years, and uh, was fortunate fortunate enough to go to law school in San Diego. It's San Diego, very nice. Yes. Uh, as far as uh, Babylon. Uh, WBAB 102.3, uh, do you remember that by any chance? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Rock Station, Classic Rock. Yeah, there you go. All right. And uh, Merrick South Shore, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That is, yeah, South Shore. We were the last exit on the, uh, anyone who knows this, the Meadowbrook Parkway. We were the last exit before you, get, you hit uh, Long Beach, Lido Beach, and Jones Beach. There you go. All right. So it's, it's, it's way out there is really what it is. Well, not really. I mean, we're in Nassau County. We're not all the way out in Suffolk County. It's uh, it's about uh, 35 minutes, 40 minutes to Manhattan uh, by car and, and about, you know, same by train. It's not that far. We, we, weren't, we weren't all the way out in Suffolk County. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I mistook. So it's the way out there as far as Nassau is concerned, because if you take that left, you're going all the way to Jones Beach. But, you know, you're you're as far as the South Shore, you're right there on the edge as far as the metal. Right there on the edge. It's, and and right. it's funny, you know, being here in Denver, there's, you know, there's no ocean here. I, fi I figured that out. Did you? <laughs> there's no ocean. Which, which, I can't believe this. Which day, which day did you figure out there was no ocean in Denver? Well, well, we just kept driving and driving. It was like, where is the beach? Where's the freaking beach? And then all of a sudden, it's mountains. And they get, the mountains get bigger and bigger. And it's like, whoa. I don't think the ocean's going to be here. Right, 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 right. All right. So so growing up on Long Island, obviously a fan of the beach. But, you know, uh, what, what, was, uh, what was Merrick like? You know, give me, uh, when you were a kid, what was it like? What was Merrick like? Wow. You know, we, we, we used to actually ride bicycles, and, and we uh, actually were able to walk around and, and not have to be driven by our parents. And uh, we, you know, it was, it, it was, you know, you played a lot of sports growing up. It was a lot of competition. And then, uh, you know, then you grow up and you find out there's something other than, than that. And, you know, I played around with some drugs back in those days and certainly was impactful in my life because it brought me out here. Uh, right. But um, Merrick was... You know, growing up on the South Shore of Long Island, my kids, and they don't understand, like, the freedoms that we had because we didn't have, you know, obviously micromanaging parents, nor did we have uh, cell phones, nor did we have the Internet, nor did we have any of these modern technologies. Hell, we just actually spoke to our friends. We, we, we rode our bikes to our friends, and we walked to our <laughs> friends, and we, we talked on the telephone, a telephone that had these, these things that used to actually dial 
you know, it was it was definitely different, <laughs> definitely different. So, uh, yeah, it was analog, to say the least. Analog, to say the least. So, you know, you said you played around with drugs a little bit. Tell us about the uh, the science project that you did with uh, with your mother. Oh, I shared that with you. You know, it's funny. When, when, when you're growing up and you're introduced to marijuana and, you know, you see how beautiful a plant it is, you want to get involved in growing it. Now, I don't. I'm not a grower, never did, never will be. Um, so I, I had a couple seeds and we had a little competition between amongst friends to see who could grow the best plants. And uh, so I thought, hey, might as well recruit mom. You know, she knows how to grow and she's home pretty much a lot so she can, you know, actually manage the plant for me. The problem was that my father was somewhat more educated to the drug world because he was actually had, had a daughter that's a couple years older than I am. and. She's like, well, I better, you know, I better learn about this stuff before my kids get too heavily involved because it's going to happen. And uh, so he came home one day from work and he saw the, the saw the plant and told my, my mother that she's growing marijuana for me and it's not a science project. And I, you know, kind of was just playing the game and using her. And you know what? She actually enjoyed the time we, we spent together doing it. But after the fact, she, you know, it was a little little trust factor kind of got, got thrown out the window. <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> just a bit. So, so what about? I mean, you know, we, you know, I know you, uh, and you know, when Joel go, it comes into the room. People know Joel's in the room. All right. I mean, that's a fair way to say it, right? I, I hope I'm not that obnoxious. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would hope that people notice me because of my good looks and and my and I'm a fairly large man in stature. But um, I hope it's not because I'm obnoxious. That would suck. Oh no! I I I I'm sorry for uh, I'm kidding with intoning yourself. intoning that. But you are a big guy, and you're you're devilishly handsome, and that's exactly what I was talking about. But you know, in terms of that personality, the Joel Schneider that we know and love, what, what, does that come more from dad? Does that come more from mom? Where does that come from? I, I gotta say, my father. We always call my father the big guy, and you know, he's pretty. Uh, you know, he he has when he when he when he speaks. You know, you, you listen, you hear him. He's. Uh, he definitely knows how to take over a room, and you know it's not something that I that I really need or want to do. But I'm glad that people do notice. I mean, I, you know, I I feel good about myself when I walk into a room. I'm pretty confident. I think you know confidence. You know, Seth, if you're confident, it, it rubs off on you, and you know you're the same way. I mean, we've met each other, we spent some time together, and, and uh, we don't know who's more confident. I I don't know who's taking over the room, me or you. You're the one with the microphone, so typically it's you. <laughs> typically, right? That's the secret: is to have the microphone. <laughs> there you go. I got to get myself one of those, huh? <laughs> there you go. That's exactly right. All right. So your dad instilled confidence. What did your mo- mother instill? If uh, if if there was one kind of aspect of her personality um i guess you know um i, I can't i can't really i mean i love my mother to death and i hope she doesn't listen to this but you know what i, I really haven't followed a lot of of my mother's advice and and uh i am i am really kind of complete the complete opposite of her she is she is so neat and so refi- refined and and that kind of thing and i'm a slob and I'm certainly not refined and uh, um, you know I, I she she filters everything she that she says and I've been told that I was born without a filter so uh, um, but you know I, I look a little bit like my mom so maybe I get some of my good looks from her there you uh, go. but outside outside of that you know we, we she's a mom she's I love her dearly but uh, you know I was always dad's boy got it all right so so back in the house you're 15 years old you have the the uh, kerfuffle with the plant, um, but what you know, what what was going on? You you've, you're confident uh, from your dad. You're you're good looking because your mom. Uh, you've got the plant going. What else is going on in your mind? What else is going on in your life as as a young man back in marriage? Well, you know, that's a transition. Fifteen at that back in those days, back in 1974. I'm giving my age away. Uh, things were so different. I mean, music was was something that you know was really on the forefront of my life. It was, it was basically, I, I transferred from sports to music, sports to partying in music. Um, you know, we love to go to see, I mean, I'm an old, I, I love the Grateful Dead, and I used to see Hot Tuna back in the day, and, you know, it was whatever we could do to, to do stupid things. I mean, I did a lot of, a lot of things that were, what I, you know, look back on and, and say, 
you know, I can't believe I was able to pull that off or got away with that or how dangerous it was. But, you know, we went to school. We did our best in school. We kind of, like, realized that, you know, school was, if you figured it out, you can get through it. And, you know, the I, the, the view was to college. The view was to get away from Merrick. My, my, you know, at 15, I'm thinking I'm 17, I'm, I'm 18, and I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to be on my own. I'm ready to be in a dorm. I'm ready to be in a house and, and uh, you know, not have the... the and I want to use the word burden, but that's the word, you know, it was like almost having, bur- it was like a burden having parents at that at that age because you just thought you were smarter than them. You thought you knew everything and you thought that, you know, you were impervious to, you know, to any danger. And quite frankly, you know, as a, as a parent, uh, it, you know, you, you realize that you weren't and you realize you got to raise your kids a little bit differently. But, you know, at 15, you know, I was, we were, we were crazy. We, we, you know, I still talk to some of my old high school friends and we laugh about some of it dumb things that we did boy oh god <laughs> you got to give us one give us one story uh no nah, they're they're really they're kind of dumb and you know um <laughs> I, you know i, I can't you know the, the, there's secrets in, in one's past that you, you need to keep I, I mean i'll give you one i'll give you one we, we'll All give right. you one it was we're, we're now it's january of 76 i guess i'm just about to or 77 I'm just about to leave to go to Buffalo. I had already graduated high school, and my, me and five high school friends decide to go to Florida, and we're going to stay down on Collins, and we're going to stay in one of those motels. And you know, we figured out well, you can you can buy you can buy as much alcohol as you want down there. They didn't, no one no one proofed us down there like they did here in New York. And I just remember coming back to to the hotel from the beach, and one of our friends basically emptied the entire room out and. All the furniture, all our clothing, I did, I'm thinking the toilet seat was all thrown into the parking lot of the Sun City Motel on Collins. And, uh, of course, we were asked to leave, but we had no place to go, man. We ended up we ended up shacking up at, at, at a girl we went to high school with's parents' place. Uh, of course, the parents never spoke to us again, but... Uh, yeah. We literally destroyed a hotel room, and there was no look back. You didn't even care. I mean, it was just, it was like, where we're going to stay tonight. That was basically it. The Sun City Motel on Collins. Sun, I'll, I'll, I'll never it. forget. It was a Sun City, right? Right near, near Castaways. Remember the, the Castaway Motel, a hotel that was on the on the bay side or on the uh, intercoastal side. This was literally right, you know, diagonally across the street. You know, pr- probably was a uh, $20 a night little crappy room. It was you turn the lights off and, and you see the cockroaches coming running out of the, out of the sink. I mean, I, I'm giving you a graphic, disgusting description, but I, I right. it's funny. I, I kind of re- still remember it. It's still vivid. <laughs> so that's the sports side, I feel like. What sports did you play? Uh, actually, I played everything. I mean, I played everything. I had, of course, just like any other New York Jew, we had a basketball court in our driveway and... So I played basketball. I was, and I'm a fairly tall person. So that was, you know, the sport I liked the most. But I played football. I played lacrosse. Actually, it was I played lacrosse when there was wooden sticks. Listen, everybody, there the sticks used to be wood. Okay, that's when when I first started playing <laughs> lacrosse, and, and uh, um, you know, I loved loved lacrosse, loved football, loved, and basketball. Though was my passion, and we all played little league. I mean. You know, Little League Baseball, I mean, what else, you know, you, you couldn't wait for the tryouts, which is different than than our kids. Uh, you know, we, we actually had a tryout for a team, and we actually got tried out, and you either made the majors or you made the minors, and, you know, if you made the majors a year early, that was a big honor, and I, well, fortunately, I was one of those kids that was able to, and nowadays, everyone's included. I mean, I remember my son's junior high school, or what they call middle school now, that yeah. there were there were there were four base. You had the A team, the B team, the C. Team. They just it was all inclusive. Everyone had to be on a team. When we were growing up, man, if you could, if you didn't make the cut, I mean, I remember I remember going to see you know trying out for basketball, and you know you go, you made the first cut. You know you, you and your friends are all, all looking at the, at the board to see if your name's on the list, and then you made this you made the team. And it was you know it, that was an honor, but people got cut. You know, yeah. there were kids that got cut, and, and nowadays it's every you know football team same thing. You know, people got cut nowadays. The, you know, it's all inclusive. Everyone plays. Everyone gets a trophy. Uh, you didn't get a trophy if you lost. <laughs> you just lost. <laughs> all right, so you're, you're not a huge fan of that. 
Um, but but uh, you know, bring us in on the softer side of, of Joel. You know, you mentioned that you were a dead fan. I know you are a a, a, a big fan. You know that that's that's almost the softer side, the music side of you, right? Well, you know what's a really soft side of me is is my kids, is my family, my my my, my what I call them, the people that are under my tent. And I almost could you know relay that to the fact that I am now the tent guy in the cannabis business. But when I say my tent, it's my children, it's my stepchildren, it's my wife. That's my soft side. That's the people I love. That's the people I care about. My dogs. I, I mean, that's that's the softer side. Music. Music's a challenge. You know. I, you know. I those concerts that I've gone to, hundreds and hundreds of concerts. I don't know that I was ever soft at those things. Those things are were, were some. Those are entertainment. Those are enjoyment. But. Um, you know, those are also work. I mean, you know, there's there's you know thousands of people around you. So I, I will say that you know once I had my personal space at a concert, you didn't want to be violated my personal space. <laughs> <laughs> you All really right. did. You know, I'm, you know, I'm six foot one, and I just like to spread out a little bit. So, you know, soft side is my family. The music side is what I I is a passion. I love. I saw two concerts last week, and and. Uh, um, got got to hang out with Jerry Garcia's daughter and, and, and Billy Kreutzman's wife last week. That was that was a neat little thing and hang out with the the uh, uh, the bassist for uh, Disco Biscuits, Mark Brownstein, who's become a friend. Um, so that you know that side of it is is yeah, I love the music. It definitely it definitely soothes the soul, so to speak. But um, does it make me um, softer? No. Well, well, I got you, and and let's I guess let's just go ahead and dive in. You said you're the tent guy in cannabis, bud and breakfast. You know, a serious topic has come up. You know, based on uh, states' laws passing, which is we we need to find uh, safe places uh, to consume, and you really you're really doing that. So I mean, you know, uh, as far as Adagio, that was the first one, right? First one was the Adagio here in, in Denver. The second one was was the Silverthorne property, the Mountain Vista up in Silverthorne. Um, and we're looking to expand now to to a camp and ranch uh, situation down in the outside of Durango, and looking for additional hotels. But you know, you said something that was really interesting, and you said the word safe. Now we could use that word in in a lot of different contexts as it relates to smoking cannabis, it's safe because there's no police around, they're safe because I'm in my home, I'm safe because I'm hiding in my garage. But what I, what I, we really try to do is create safety. And safety meaning that we will educate our guests uh, as to the use of cannabis and the fact that what they're smoking today is not what they smoked 20, 30 years ago. It's not what they smoked at home because Colorado has the best growers in, in the country. I'm sure California would argue that. But right. we also have the concentrates and the, and, and, and the edibles. And there are so many different ways to ingest it now. And, and the level of THC is much higher. So we educate. We, we create safety. We create security. We, I don't want to say we monitor our guests because no one wants to be monitored. But we certainly you know, keep after them. We, we, we are on top of them. We make sure that they're drinking their waters. We make sure that they're eating their foods. We make sure that... Uh, you know, they are comfortable and in the in what we believe to be the, I'm going to use a stupid word, but I think it's the coolest place on earth. It's, it's you've never seen anything like it. Well, okay. And, you know, I, I think that uh, your uh, patrons would agree, and we'll get into that in, in, in a second, but you said you went to, to Buffalo for college and San Diego for law school. How does the New York guy through and through get to Colorado what when you know when did you first kind of realize that you wanted to do something in the space and and how did it turn into to bud and breakfast um, I, I would have to say that was 1974 um, <laughs> I had just smoked my first joint and I'm like did I like this this could be a business this could really be a business if you if you market it correctly and sell it to the right people you can make a lot of money um, no, in reality, I mean, I've really, you know, and, and I've said this to you, and I'm saying this to our listeners, I've smoked since I'm 14, 15 years old, uh, pretty much right. nonstop, and, and not that I, I don't smoke during the day at work, but when I get home, you know, while others will have a cocktail, I'll have a joint, and I, I really, it, it, you know, I, I think if our listeners are hearing me, I'm kind of high energy, it's a way to bring me down to that, you know, 
that baseline that I need to be, and it helps it helps me relax. But right. in, in answer to your, your question, I mean, when, when you, if you follow this 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 story, the story of legalization of cannabis, it goes back to you know the first of medical states, but then it really goes to when Colorado started looking at this as, as, as a business model, the business model being when they set up vertical integration, which no longer exists, but vertical integration was the, where, bis, where, where the, the dispensaries and the grows had to basically partner, whether they be contractually partnered, be acquired. It was, it was the tax model, though. It was able, it, it allowed Colorado basically in, uh, to, to monitor the plant from uh, seed or from, from clone all the way to harvest and to drying, and they, this gave them an opportunity to tax it and tax it liberally. Um, right. So I, I, seed I, to I, sell, I, seed I, I to mean, sell. Well, yeah. So I would. I was talking to people back in uh, 2009, 2010, people from Colorado uh, that were introduced to me through a third party, and, and I started coming out here and, and uh, looking at the opportunities available to me. Now, though, back then I was looking at the growing opportunities and dispensing op- opportunities. Which I can, I said, as I said earlier, I have no clue of, and you can't be in a business where you really don't know what you're doing. Um, not to mention, that, not to say that I know what I'm doing in the hotel business, but at least in this business, there was a lot more competition out there. So, you know, they would eat my lunch. And so I came out in 2010. Uh, I followed the space. I followed Connecticut. I followed New Jersey's uh, medicinal laws. I got involved with a head shop company that was an online head shop company company. I just wanted to learn everything about cannabis, the business, uh, you know, and I looked at it from, hey, I, I like the picks and acts scenario. Uh, and when I say picks and acts, uh, we're talking uh, paraphernalia, that type of stuff. I, you know, you go back to looking at, you know, the days of mining, uh, you know, you, you had your gold miners and, and, and they they made whatever they made, but the guys that sold them the pick, the guys that sold them the shovels, the axes, the tents, the, the Levi jeans, they're all still in business, but where are the miners? The miners are no longer in business. So I looked at it from that perspective. I, you know, there's, there's an ancillary business that I'm going to fit into, um, and ultimately, it was the, the lodging space that that uh, it just seemed natural. I mean, it seemed natural because I was staying in a hotel, and I was my best friend was my toilet. I mean, what, what kind of what kind of best friend is that? They don't they don't talk back to you. You know, they don't when there's no no fluid conversation. And it wasn't even smoking with me. It was just accepting the smoke I was blowing in the toilet. So that's really where this all came about. That's where, you know, I said we need, if they're not going to let us have social clubs, they're not going to let the dispensaries allow smoking in a some sort of common area close to them or part of it, there needs to be this type of thing. And, uh, um, you know, started knocking on doors, literally started knocking on doors to find out, you know, to find the place and ultimately found the Adagio. Got it. So you found the Adagio. So what year did you find the Adagio if you started looking in 2010? We, no, 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 no. I didn't come back. I'm sorry. I didn't come, I guess I wasn't clear. So when legalization came in, in January 2014, the same people that I was connected with uh, several years ago started calling, we, we can use your help. We can use some money. We can use this. You, you, there's an opportunity here for you. You should come back. And that's when I came back in, in Feb- on February 6th of 2014, right after Denver lost the Super Bowl. It was hard to get flights. It was, uh, you know, also, if you remember New York last year, it was, it was a ton of snow. Came out here February 6th, um, and that was the start of, of what ultimately became full-time. Um, we moved out, took an apartment April 15th, uh, and then really August was when uh, Lisa and I, my, Lisa's my wife, uh, we, we packed up the, the house, we packed up the dogs, and we said, we're here full time. All right, and so then how did you find the Adagio? How, if you're knocking on doors, knocking on doors, what, what was the fit? How was it a fit? Well, you know, what happened really was, went to a couple places and, you know, tried to make deals, whatever, and one of the, one of the, one of the places I went to was up the block from the Adagio, and um, the owner of that place had said, no, you know, we're not interested, but there's another bed and breakfast literally on the other side of, of Colfax. You should go talk to that person. I, I rang the doorbell. Uh, an old, a woman named Helen Strader answered the door, and, and sweetheart of a lady. And the first thing she said to me when I told her what I wanted to do, she goes, 
you're my you're my savior. You're my godsend. I, I've been waiting for you to come. You know, for the last few years, it, I'm, and I'm not making that up. This is what she said. I, she was tired. She had no desire to do this anymore. From what I understand, is a the the the, the uh, shelf life of, of of an innkeeper is like four four and a half years. So she was tired. She had bought this place originally to for for her and her son to operate. She ultimately just operated it on her own. Um, she was cannabis friendly. I will say this: she would let people smoke on the patio. Uh, so she really started. I give her credit. She started. We just forwarded. We just you know took it to another level in that we wanted it in the in the common areas, and we wanted we don't want people smoking in their room, and we wanted to create this whole social environment. It's not just the the room. It's the it's the situation. It's the it's what we do socially. It's what the guests do socially amongst each other, which is really the biggest the biggest draw to me. I think it's amazing how total strangers from all walks of life become fast friends, become Facebook friends, and, you know, email friends, and and they are just enjoying what Colorado has to offer. And you know, they share amongst each other, and and it's beautiful to see. It really is. Yeah, and, and I've. Uh... You've said to me, cannabis is meant to be passed. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you pass a joint. There's that old, uh, you know, don't bogart that joint, my friend. Don't bogart means don't hold it to yourself. Don't keep it to yourself. You you pass that joint to me, and that's what it is. I mean, it's we pass it around, and that's always been what I always knew was, you know, yeah, we all sometimes smoke by ourselves, but we would prefer to smoke with others. Got it. And uh, you're providing that community, providing that safe environment. But as far as getting the word out, there's some restrictions on how you can market and what you can do with marketing. So how did you get the word out? Well, you know, yeah, you raised some good points. I mean, you know, we, we can't buy Google ads and, and the like. Uh, so social media, which is supposed to be, you know, cutting edge, is not so cutting edge when it relates to cannabis. How we've gotten the word out literally is through through the press through, uh, we've gotten, you know, several press, re- you know, we started just with a simple press release, which got picked up by uh, Huffington Post and New York Times. This goes back, you know, April 10th of last year. Uh, we've done a 60 Minutes piece. The Guardian was just, was, the, was just at the hotel last week. So we do a lot of, you know, we do a lot of media. Um, I attend events. I attend, the, you know, the, the events that you, you hosted. Um, and, and I will attend more of those. But you know, we, we, we do buy some print ad. We, you know, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I just don't know that it works. Um, you know, every, every print ad that we've ever purchased uh, has kind of, I'm not going to say backfired, but it certainly hasn't driven business that we, that we can actually, that, tang- that we can actually tangibly hold and say, hey, this came from that ad. Right. Um, you know, we, we are a, an attraction on Google, so while we can't buy uh Google ads, we do we do come up first in 420 uh, uh, friendly uh, lodging. We come up if you look at the bottom, you know, we come up, and that's basically how you find this. And plus, a, a word of mouth, believe it or not, still actually works around around here. And and a lot of our guests are repeat guests or, or friends of repeat guests or friends of friends of repeat guests. Uh, we've had a lot of that. We'll we'll get into you know some of the guests. I mean some of the guests you you already kind of uh, foreshadowed the fact that you you know some some folks that have stayed with you are definitely names that we know, right? Oh uh, sure. I mean uh, we've had the Disco Biscuits stay with us. Uh, we've had members of Lotus, which is another band, stay with us. Uh, we've had some uh, former NFL players. I don't think they want me to mention their names, but they uh, we just had one this past weekend stay with us. Um, and you know, typically we we've had bands that I can't mention because they their their crowds are a much younger crowd, but that's another way where where we get you know they 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 have been our partners. I mean, I'll 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 I'll, I'll give them a room if they're going to tweet out and they're going to Instagram and they're going to uh, Facebook and you know I'm saying terms that you know I got to talk to my son and my and my staff about because I you know me I'm not that good at it, but you know that's. Uh, um, so that becomes a you know benefit to us, and they like it. You know what what our guests, and certainly the famous ones. You know they look at it as a small place. We give them the freedom to do what they want to do as far as cannabis is concerned. The fact that the Adagio is so close to the Fillmore, the Ogden, the Bluebird, which are all theaters here in, in, in Denver, 
uh, you know, that makes it a, a, an attractive place as, as well. But, you know, they, you know, it's a new thing for them. You, you would never think that a rock and roll band is going to stay at a bed and breakfast, but they will stay at a bed and breakfast. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Um, the, the other side of the coin, uh, of course, is, is cannabis as medicine, and, and you've absolutely had uh, a few patients uh, come through. So just take us through uh, some of those stories. Um, we, you know, the, the, the biggest stories that I, you know, we, we've talked about and we talk about amongst each other is really the post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, guests that we've had stay with us, ones who have, have not tried cannabis, who, you know, one guest in particular oh, definitely overdid it the first day. We brought in a consult and we walked him through the whole process. And by the third, fourth day, uh, we were getting hugs and kisses from him and his wife. Saying that you know they you know they, that they've enjoyed the stay of course but the the use of cannabis how it was taught to them to use it really had had, had allowed the, the the guests to to sleep literally sleep that was that was one of his you know the biggest problems was sleep we've had some epilepsy patients that have come and uh, you know it's great that we're able to provide this safe place so that they they don't have to go hide and they don't have to be fearful in a hotel that they bought the cannabis now they want you know they want to use it. With us, they're using it with people that, of knowledge around them. Not only the guests that our guests are knowledgeable, but of course our staff is knowledgeable. So we're able to, you know, be we've we've trained the staff now to be consults to 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 almost they're not bud tenders so to speak, but they understand the product. They know how to applicate the product. They know how to they know how to talk to the guests about the product, and and that's really you know it's 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 I didn't get into the medical side of it. Uh, Seth, and that wasn't my goal, but the rewards are are abundant. The, the rewards are so, I mean, they're they're so welcome, and and, and I and I really, you know, I, again, I didn't come out here to, to to change the world. I didn't come out here to make people. I just came out here because I saw the opportunity and the fact that I'm I, I'm doing the right thing, and the fact that people enjoy what we do, and, and people have been able to get the medicines that they need. Uh, to treat whatever their their, their disease or, or it, it's it's a wonderful it's really wonderful it, it, it it's 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 a byproduct of what we do it's, it wasn't again it wasn't the 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 what the result that we were seeking to accomplish but that is an, an incredible byproduct. Fantastic. I mean, you know, that there's not much to, to say there. It's fantastic. It's it's just wonderful. Uh, you know what, so it, it, you know you know what we do, Seth. That's kind of unusual. That's different than all others and. And I know, you know, again, we've been together at, at, at these expos and the count awards, and I've been to a lot of these things, and I know a lot of my brethren in the industry. What my company does, and my we actually, we tend, we actually touch the guests, we touch the 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 user, the the tourist that's coming out here. We're the ones who actually get to see how they, they really enjoy the product. Uh, whereas, you know, the dispensaries sell it, yeah, and it's really cool that, uh, that you go in there and you can see all these various strains and, and you talk to these people that are experts. And But what we get is is that end result, and it's really, you know, it's, it's not to get emotional, but it's really, you know, a wonderful, wonderful thing that, that we're able to do. And, and, you know, I'm happy that our guests, you know, understand what we're trying to do. And you know they applaud it, and they whether it be somebody who needed it from medicinal, someone who came out here just because they you know wanted to try it recreationally and try it in you know the best product in the world, it's really kind of you know a neat experience that yeah. we, we get to uh, enjoy almost every day. Yeah, and and you replicated that, so you had the adagio first. Get into to where uh, where that went with Silverthorn. Um, in October, we, we opened up Silverthorn. Um, that's a four, four, four and a half bedroom. Sometimes we use the fifth bedroom. It's right in the middle of, uh, uh, of the mountains. You got Breckenridge, you got Keystone, you got uh, Loveland, A Base, and all these, these copper, all these mountains around it. Um, it's, a, it's unlike the Adagio, and the Adagio is an old Victorian 1892. This is more of a ski chalet. Uh, we just recently put it in a game room, um, realizing that. You know, now that the winter season is over, the ski, you know, that, that's obviously a big draw. But the summers in Colorado are also big. We got we got the mountain bikings, we got so many out, outdoor activities, and now we've added a, a game room. We put a, a pool table and uh, air hockey and uh, 
uh, some darts. And so the downstairs is, is a game room. The upstairs is your tr traditional living room. And, um, you know, our, our guests love it up there. I mean, it's, again, it's a unique opportunity that doesn't exist in any other, other place in Colorado. Or and, the world. And, yeah, and, and getting in there, though, wasn't uh, uh, necessarily seamless as Adagio. Well, tell, take us through what... Uh, you know, well, you, you had to have certain sign off and, you know, take us through well, that. No, what, you, what you're alluding to is, is and, 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 and it's a good question, you know, you learn from your mistakes. Um, I opened up Denver without going through the proper channels and now I had to backtrack and, 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 get, and, and eliminate one of the things that we, we did, which, which was a bud bar. We eliminated because the, the city said I'm, I, I could be engaged in distribution. I, I still don't believe it. I will fight this. Uh, but that's, you know, so then I did make a mistake, but, you know, we are now operating correctly under the law. And while I think what I was doing was correct before that, who needs to get the auditor from the police? In Silver Thorn, once I, once I learned that, that, you know, there are town officials that you should go talk to. And there's, you know, the city is bigger. It's a bigger situation. But in these small towns um, like a Silver Thorn, you go to the town manager. You go to the chief of police, uh, and I and you sit down with them and you explain to them what you what you're doing, how you you plan to do it. Ask them if they have any issues with it. We go through the local ordinances to see if we fit within the, the local ordinances, and uh, that's how we, we we now navigate through this. Uh, uh, I went through it in Breckenridge, which is unfortunate that we weren't able to open there. Um, I still think that the law allows us to do it, but if, if the police say to you, you know, uh, they keep throwing and, and modifying or, or taking two laws and trying to match them together, no matter what, at the end of the day, if I say it's legal and I believe it's legal, I don't need my guests to be hassled. I don't need us to be hassled. I don't need, because again, one of the, the things that you mentioned earlier, one of the things that I've repeated is safety and security, and we want our guests to feel secure. We want our guests to feel safe. We don't want them to feel paranoid. I mean, that's that that kind of like you know defeats the whole purpose. So um, <laughs> yes, we do have to go through uh, you know a litany of of legalities uh, to ensure that what we do is is done correctly. Um, and we've we've learned that. I mean, we we have too many lawyers on our staff now. I mean, I, it seems like every law law firm that's cannabis related, I've I've retained. There, there you go. <laughs> well, you you were a, a lawyer yourself. I know you you say you know securities law is not the same thing in any way. But it, what kind of lessons did you learn from you know practicing securities law for for all those years that well, you're applying now? You know, I could read law as a law student and as a lawyer, uh, whether it be securities law, whether it be traffic law. I, I could read ordinances. I know how to research ordinances. I know how to research the law. That obviously has given me a leg up. Um, it's also given me a leg up that you know, as a security attorney, I can I can do. We are a public company, so I, I don't get I don't do my own filings per se, but I oversee them and walk them through, and and I have paralegals that will ultimately complete the project for us with our auditors. Um, you know, when I go to a law firm that I hire, it's you're not you don't have to you don't have to give me that you know 15 minute half hour briefing on what a lawyer is. I get it. Understand it. Got it. Let's go. Let, now let's talk about the, the situation at hand. I don't need to be explained, you know, what what the, what what a lawyer is and what a lawyer means to me and what their jobs are. So yes, those things are uh, certainly give me an advantage over over others. If 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 for no other reason, saving time. Saving time and money. I mean, um, if you I don't know lawyers. Well, time time is stuff. money, right? You know. Lawyers are expensive, Seth. Have you noticed that? I have noticed that, yes. Yeah, they're just too expensive. Uh, I don't particularly like them. <laughs> but you, <laughs> but you, you, you realize that you practice law for what, 20, 30 years, right? Uh, I practiced for 30 years. 30 years, yes. <laughs> But, uh, well, but not, 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 not too many really, friends really. retained this, as lawyers. I thought this was or, going so wait, Seth, Seth, I thought this was going so great. Now you gotta <laughs> now you gotta depress me. Thanks. <laughs> well tell me about how about tell me about law school in San Diego? What was that? How'd you get anything done? You know what? It was actually kind of a neat experience because I left everyone, uh, went as far as you could possibly go from Buffalo, if you look at a map. <clears throat> I was alone, man. I was alone. I was with older people. I was told that, you know, half the class wasn't going to graduate. 
I was told a lot of things, and you know, you, you know, you, you know, you're taking your, your dad's money, your parents' money to, to fund this this thing. So, you, if you get through the first year of law school, and any law student or any 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 lawyer that's listening or hears this is going to know what I'm saying. Once you get through year one, the next two years are okay. It's it's cake. It really is. It's that first year that is that that is the difficult year. It's the year that you need to reprogram yourself. Um, you know, actually, you know, learn yourself and learn from the inside and, and how, because I never really studied. I mean, studying, well, what was studying? I mean, it was just like, you know, it was this, this is easy. This was work. This was, this was work. And it was, um, but the fact that I was away uh, from all my friends and, and all the, you know, bad elements, or I should say bad elements, but, you know, things that, that were certainly attractive to me there. Uh, were not available to me out there at, at first. So, you know, I might as well focus on, on, on getting through this. There you go. And you, you kind of, you mentioned early on, I don't know if you uh, realized that you said, once you figure it out, you can you can do it. You know, and it sounds like that's what you're talking about at law school. You, you kind of figured it out. Is that right? Well, I, th- I, th- I think that goes with everything. I think that goes with life. You know, I'm not going to be, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not that deep, but, um, you know, look, if you can figure, everything's, everything's, an, to me, is an equation, everything is a, is a jigsaw puzzle, everything is, and if, you know, it's just, you got to look at it from a certain perspective and kind of figure it out and, and, and navigate your way through it, and that's, you know, where I'm here, that's why I'm here, you know, I, I, I looked at it from what can I do and how can I get into this space, and how can I be successful in this space? And you figure it out. Yeah, it's about figuring it out. There you go. All right, so you figured out Adagio. You figured out Silverthorn. What's uh, what's the next project here? Oh, I stressed my company out. Oh, did I stress? No one's happy with me right now. We're doing a camp. <laughs> camp. We're, 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 we're literally taking over a ranch, 172-acre ranch. Uh, this summer comes July 1, Um we don't know how, how long we're going to run it. I would say at least at the end of September, but maybe into early October, depending on bookings. And it's 172 acres. It's got uh, cabins for 44 people. Um, it's on. There's a huge uh, lake on within an eighth of a mile, which offers every water sport known to man. Uh, there are, will be 10 horses on the property. We will have horticulturists. We'll have glass blowing. We'll have hash making. We'll have... Um, cooking with cannabis, we'll have your, your basic activities like softball and volleyball, and well, there's a pool and a hot tub, and uh, three meals a day, all-inclusive, uh, breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner. We'll do our wake-and-bake breakfast like we do at the, the Adagio and Silverthorne. Uh, we'll also do a 420 happy hour and before dinner. Um, we'll have excursions to Telluride and to Durango as well. Um, this will be an experience like no other. Nothing like this has ever been done. Nothing like the Adagio has never been done. But this is, this is where you know you 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 come and, and you just it's a retreat. It's a ranch. You'll have your your, your morning yoga. You can have your sunset yoga. You know we have uh, a massage. You know we have massage therapists. Um, everything that a, that a resort will have, but in a more ranch setting. Um, you know, and, and it's literally if you want to hike, you want to bike, you want to, whatever you want to do, it's available to you there, and um, it's going to be really neat. It's it's a it, the ranch exists. It, it, it's so we don't have to build cabins, we don't have to build a lodge, we don't have to build. That's all been there. It's a dude ranch for over fifty years, um, and we're just going to make a can of camp or the MJ Ranch, you know, for lack of a better term. And um, you know, that's that's our project right now. That is that is. A focus. Uh, fortunately, the, the two bed and breakfast operate uh, pretty pretty well on their own, so we don't need to be you know ma- micromanaging those. Uh, and we you know that's a focus. And the focus, the second focus, is hotels and bigger spaces, bigger bigger properties, um, and also you know other states, uh, Oregon and, and, and Washington, to name to name two, are are, cer- are certainly on our radar. Um, and you know we we want to make this a national brand. I'm looking. You know, uh, to to be a, you know a national hotel chain. So all right, so we'll get to national, we'll get to Oregon, we'll get to Washington. As far as the ranch is concerned, you mentioned uh, you mentioned hiking, you mentioned the the lake, and you know 
Uh, most most ranches have animals. You got animals. You got horses. There there are there will be. Uh, we didn't want to be in the dude ranch business. We didn't want to be in the. You know, we will. Our guests will be smoking cannabis. But yes, we are partnered with the ranch itself, who have, will maintain ten ten head of horses on the property. Um, plus, mom has two more horses that are not rideable. But there will be ten horses that are rideable, right on, and will be literally roaming. The paddocks of the ranch. It's not like back east. I remember, you know, all, all the horses stay in a barn. Now the horses actually just kind of meander around the property, you know, uh, in a fenced-in area. So our guests can be able to walk right up to a horse, and they, if they so desire, want to pet his nose, give it an apple. It, it, that's available. Obviously, they can ride them. Um, we've been the suggestion of, of, of cattle has also come up. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know about having cattle there, but. <laughs> definitely horses, um, and definitely a lot of uh, nature. Um, there's a lot of nature. I was up there, and I don't want to scare anybody, but we drove up on, on, on the road to the ranch uh, last weekend, and a bear ran across the street. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I've never seen a bear run across the street. <laughs> you, you know, no, no bears in Merrick. No, there are no bears in Merrick. Never saw one, but it was really neat. I got to tell you, Seth, it was like, we're just driving, and you know, I'm in the front seat. I'm not driving, and, and Tyson says to me, he "Goes, that's a bear." I'm like, "What? Look at so, that thing, man! It just ran across the street, went down to a school bus. It wasn't going to school, but it was certainly went down to the school bus, and it was an, I mean, an empty bus. There was no kids. There was, there was parking a lot. I don't want to sound like a freak here, but um, it was really neat, you know. And, and you know, and there's there's elk and deer. And, you know, it's abundant, man. It's all over the place. So there there'll be plenty of animals for people to see." Um, but there will be horseback riding available, and we can we can also arrange it, you know other things for our guests if they want if they want to ride, um, you know. But there's we have 170 acres, and there's easements to the San Juan National Forest, uh, so you can basically ride in thousands and thousands of acres. The only restriction on, on going into national forests is its national land, and you know it's marijuana is illegal under federal law, so that's. That's the one thing we need to, you know, counsel our guests on as it relates to that. So we'll stay away from that. But uh, the ranch uh, or uh, camp is is this summer's uh, project as far as Washington and, and uh, uh, you mentioned Portland. What what uh, you know what where do you what's the timeline on that as far as you're concerned? I would say the timeline would be uh, sometime after the summer. Um, we'll start making inroads. Um, but, you know, in order for me to, to take the staff necessary and, you know, and, you know, we just finished our operating procedures and manuals, but there's still a training process that we, we put our, our, our employees through. So, you know, I'm limited as far as personnel is concerned. We're going to have a lot directed down there. You know, if things grow larger and, and, than I anticipated and I, ha- and I can afford to go and, and staff those things and do the training, then it may be earlier. But I'm looking more like... Uh, Late summer, early fall, for to move out of you know to go looking and find places outside of outside the state of Colorado. And we're not done. We're not done in Colorado. Um, there are plenty of locations. I mean, that's you know where we have have actually focused uh, a lot of our time and attention is to going to various facilities. Lisa and I have driven the state, um, literally from top to bottom, east to west, north to south. Um, We've been to some beautiful places. We've been to some places that aren't so beautiful. Uh, so we're, we're, we are looking here. We could manage a place here in Colorado a lot easier because of the staff being here. Uh, so I, I would wait till after the summer to really start getting out of state. But we are also looking to expand the model here. Got it. And, uh, and I guess the, the last piece that I know I've spoken to you about is, uh, is medical states. We, um, we're looking at that model from the standpoint of, and you, you, know, you mentioned this earlier, uh, about you know, the, some of the guests that have come in and, and they've been patients. They're not necessarily guests. They're not, they're not my patients, but they're, they're, medicinal, patient, they're, they're medicinal patients of, of, of cannabis. And so we see opportunities where there are states that have medical on, on the books um, and people are, are going to those states, but they don't have a place to stay. They don't have a place to utilize the product. So we're, we have on the drawing board MMJ care facilities. Uh, I'll equate them to a Ronald McDonald's house. It's not just the patient coming, 
with the patient and his support, whether it be family, whether it be friends, you know, they will have their support around them, and they will, and will have, of course, medical technicians, doctors, nurses uh, available to prescribe the, the medicine that they need and be able to use it in a safe place and be monitored, you know, and see what, what treatments work and what don't. Um, so that's another, again, it's being the tent guy, and, and that's just another tent that we can put up. Um, you know, maybe that's like my, my mash unit tent. That's your, that's your mash tent. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Well played. So, um, you know, we've uh, we've gone through a lot. I I, uh, I have my my final two questions. You know that I that I want to ask you. Um, the first one is uh, industry. What what have you learned most? You know, in in cannabis. What what has most surprised you in in cannabis? Um, you know, the, the people that are involved. Um, my brethren here in this industry. Um, it's not a bunch of stoners just trying to, you know, make a buck and be drug dealers. It's people who've, who I've met out here and work with out here are professionals. Um, they, they carry themselves in a, in a professional manner. Um, they really respect the plant, respect the, 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 the uh, uh, tourist, the, 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 the user. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I go into into dispensaries and they're a lot nicer than liquor stores. They're a lot cleaner. They're a lot safer. Um, so I think, you know, they, the, the people that, and, and they're, they're really the, the leaders of the industry. I'm just kind of, I came in on towards, no, I don't say the back end, but I came in a little later than most. These, the, the ones who have set the foundation for, for us have done a great job. Um, I respect them. Uh, for the most part, everyone I've met out here, uh, that's engaged in the industry takes it re- takes it really seriously and takes and understands their responsibilities and you would not have thought that you know I'm sure a lot of people who have not been here you know still think of it I know the federal government still thinks of it they you know it's a bunch of you know drug addicts having a good time but you know what we come to work and we work hard and we put in our days and, and we put in our hours and you know we amongst this community, respect one another and uh, um, you know we, we look out for each other we make sure that we're, we're all on the, you know somewhat on the same page obviously there's competition um, not so much for me but there's competition and you know it's it's but you can still play fair exactly no it, it is absolutely uh, uh, good business people you say play fair that's exactly right and people that take it very seriously uh, and and like you said uh, treat the plant with respect. Scott Van Rixel uh, said uh, to me, uh, it's a female plant. It deserves respect, which is a great yeah, line. Yeah, she's a lady. <laughs> she's a lady. Uh, what? Uh, all right, so the biggest and uh, final question, what has surprised you most in life, Joel Schneider? What has surprised me most in life? Well, that's a deep question, Seth. How can I answer? How many hours do we have? Uh, what, what surprised me is, you know, not there is no surprises. You you know, I kind of said it earlier about figuring it out. You know, life is throws you a lot of curveballs, man. You just got to, you know, you just got to wait for the pitch and, and hit it. Um, you know, if you if you walk around just, you know, worried about what's coming, what's around the next corner, you're gonna live a live a really paranoid kind of a demented life. There, you know, to me, you know, there's surprises every day. I told you, you know, I was I was shocked on Saturday. I found out my dog was dying. You know that that's a surprise, but you know in life you got to be you got to expect it that there's going to be a surprise around every corner. Um, you know, being out here uh, just to kind of narrow it, it, it they, you know we we've got this great industry and we've got this great business going that provides a lot of tax revenue uh, to the cities and state of Colorado, city of Denver, state of Colorado. But they have not necessarily figured out the other side of which is where the social side of it is and how it's going to be, you know, utilized. And if people are coming here, you got to create some sort of place for them to go. Uh, that's a surprise that we've, we're a year and a half into this and we, we haven't figured that out. But in surprise in life, I'm not, you know what, you know, you can answer the same way. I mean, it's life is, you wake up every day, you don't know. You just don't know. You just got to, you put your pants on, you put your smile on your face, you go to work and, 
you just hope that that you know any surprise you get is a good one. <laughs> you just go do it. I just gotta do it, man. I you know I don't want to st- steal uh, Nike, but you know you got to. I mean, well, no, I got you got it better than. It just just do it is is uh, it pales in comparison to you got to figure it out. That's uh, that's the Joel Schneider mantra. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right, Joel. Hey, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll do this again down the line, and uh, I'll see you real soon. But really appreciate it. Not a problem, Seth. I enjoyed doing it. Joel Schneider, Bud and Breakfast, providing uh, necessary places for. Uh, Consumption of legal cannabis, absolutely uh, a welcome uh, addition to the space, something that is uh, certainly necessary. Uh, so he's doing his part, and uh, as far as his advice to uh, to us, uh, lessons learned from uh, his experience, you got to figure it out. <laughs>